I'm Zoe, and I'm anorexic. I'm 19 years old, and I'm 5'7", and I weigh 35 kilos. And my mom says I'm ugly. I agree I'm not very pretty. I have nothing but bones and skin. How did I get like this? Honestly, I can't remember. For some reason, I'm blindfolded. For some reason, it seems that I was born, grew, grew, and then suddenly became like this. I wasn't interested in how I got to this point. I was more concerned about how to get out of it. With this inquiry, I decided to go to a school counselor. Mrs. Byrne worked for us for about a year. I like the fact that our school counselor was a young, pleasant woman. She gave me more time than everyone else, and also, all our conversations remained confidential. She didn't even say anything to my mom or anyone else. She had no idea before that I was anorexic. I went to her myself, and I took off my 10 sweatshirts and t-shirt, even though it was summer outside. She asked if I was hot in that, but I said I was comfortable because, first of all, I wasn't actually hot. I was freezing all the time, and secondly, it helped cover up my thinness. Everyone knew I was thin, but they never saw how thin I really was. Everything was difficult for me in my condition. Walking, lying down, standing for a long time, and I hardly ate, often drank water, could eat one small can of yogurt all day, and that was it. If I forced myself to eat more, I immediately vomited. One day when I was changing my clothes, my mother came into my room. This happened about a year ago. At the time, I'd lost weight rapidly for reasons unknown to me. My mother saw me and started yelling at the whole room that I was ugly. At that moment, something inside me gave me such a painful tingle. It was not from the pain in my stomach. It was something deeper, something in my soul. I thought that since my mother didn't like me, it was time to do something about myself. But as luck would have it, I lost my appetite even more. I began to eat even less and lose weight even faster. My mother would grab my hand and make me eat the entire plate of food. If I refused, she would slap my hands, but she didn't see the pain I was in afterward, sitting on the toilet for hours, suffering from undigested food and vomiting. I lost another kilo, and then another, and another, and went to a psychologist. Mrs. Byrne often asked about my mother, but I loved her with all my heart, so I talked about how wonderful she was. Then my psychologist wanted to talk to her, but I said my mom was very busy. She was. She worked a lot because I didn't have a father. Byrne asked if my mom had any boyfriends. I didn't understand what that had to do with the topic, so I refused to answer. Although, something inside gave me a big ache. Something in my heart area. Byrne said she wouldn't push it and handed me a piece of paper that outlined a couple of ways to improve my appetite. And you had to start small, like getting into the habit of eating at least a little breakfast. To observe the dynamics, she advised me to record the results. She took out a camera and asked me to undress my shirt. So I did. Stood against the wall and she took a picture. The moment the flash blinded my eyes, I closed them and remembered something. Then I went home. The next day, Byrne came up to me. She asked me how I was doing and invited me into her office. I sat down and began to tell her that everything was fine, that I had eaten a little in the morning and my mother was happy. The psychologist asked me about yesterday. I asked with surprise, and what happened yesterday? Don't you remember anything? You gave me a prescription and I went home. Why? You don't remember anything? No. The psychologist wrote something down. Then she wished me luck and I left. In the evening, my mother made me eat again. I ate and someone came home. It was her boyfriend. We said hello. Mom said they were about to take a shower and go to the movies. Mom's boyfriend was a photographer. I asked him how his work was, and he bragged about his new lens, and then offered to take my picture. I sat down in my chair happy. Flash. He took my picture, and I went into the other room. My mom came up to me before she left. She seemed angry. When I asked her why, she said that I was making fun of her, that I had no right to do that, and that I was ugly. I didn't understand anything, but just in case, after they left, I went to eat through sheer force. When I went to the bathroom, I was again suffering from pain in my stomach. Then I noticed how much hair had fallen out and one tooth had chipped off. I was in a state of shock. I had no choice but to call Byrne and tell her everything. She came to me in the middle of the night and calmed me down, gave me some pills, washed my face, and put me to bed. I felt so good at that moment. She asked again about my mom's boyfriend, and I told her that he was a photographer and that they were now out on a date. Has he photographed you, even once? She asked me. I said he had. Then she asked for the pictures, but I said I didn't have any for some reason. She left me in the room and asked if she could use the computer at home, and I said yes, and she found something there. 
I went to the computer and happened to see pictures I'd never seen before. I was in a terrible state, in tears and bruised. I looked at my body and saw the abrasions. I was frightened. I said I didn't remember anything. I got dizzy and finally remembered something. They were fragments of memories, only it seemed to me as if they weren't mine but someone else's. And they were very scary, frightening, full of pain. I cried. Byrne hugged me, and then she sat across from me and told me to pack my things and come to her house. I did as she said. I packed my bag, but just before we left, we ran into my mom and her boyfriend. They freaked out and started asking who she was and why she was taking me. The psychologist shielded me with herself. Mom started yelling that she was going to call the police, and Byrne said she'd called them herself. How dare you, yelled Mom's boyfriend. And you shut up, you freak, said Byrne. You, both of you, are bullying the child. She didn't used to be like that. She was complete, right? What did you do to her? I found the pictures. I'll show them in court. You've been starving her. I found a video of you, Mom, telling her how fat she is, and your man says she doesn't fit in the frame. Did you know that the flash of the camera gives her epilepsy attacks? And did you know that after that, her memory wipes out, but her subconscious remembers everything? Her brain desperately resists painful memories for the simple reason that you are her mother, yelled Byrne. I listened to this as if it weren't about me. I was scared, my body ached, and I felt nauseous. Byrne kept talking about how my mother was a monster and that she'd brought me to the state. And then my mother exploded. She started talking about how men hadn't looked at her before because her daughter was too fat and that she was ashamed of it. That after she met her boyfriend, he started saying I should be put on a diet and they were both starving me just to make me a little prettier. I looked at them and I couldn't believe it. I fell to the floor, but I didn't lose consciousness. I was suddenly terrified to be in this house. Byrne was holding my hand in such a way that it nearly broke a bone. She pushed my mother's boyfriend and ordered him out of her way. He swung his arm, but Byrne fought back. At that moment, I remembered my mother hitting me, not giving me food, and my obsession with my figure. Every word of my mother's disgust, every word about my figure made me nauseous, and I began to lose weight. Five minutes later, the police arrived. Mom and her boyfriend were arrested. Byrne took me in. I stayed with her for a while. I was dragged to courts, to the station. Byrne hired a lawyer, and they both got sued for abusing me. I felt terrible. I couldn't believe my brain was so adapted to the pain. Finally, after three months, we won the lawsuit. They rewrote the entire estate to me as compensation, and they both got jail time. Afterward, Byrne took care of me thoroughly. She treated me in all kinds of ways, but you know what helped the most? She loved me. She became my sister and got custody of me. It's been a long time since then, but this morning I woke up for the first time and made breakfast for the two of us, which I ate with great pleasure. The scale was plus two pounds, and that's our victory. Hello everyone, my name is Christina, and my dream came true since childhood, to have big breasts. I myself cannot believe that I have achieved the goal, but it is so. Now I will tell you everything in more detail. I am waiting for your comments under the video, and from your side, like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'll start with the fact that when I was little, I liked to try on adult outfits. I loved to spin for hours in front of the mirror, imagining that I was going somewhere beautiful at a chic event and everyone was admiring me. Once my mother was changing in front of me and I noticed her breasts. I was wondering why I don't have them, and my mother just said that they will grow up. I couldn't believe that I would ever have such beautiful breasts like hers. Mom put on a black bra and a black blouse. It looked just awesome. I asked what a bra is for, and my mother said that it emphasizes the breasts. Plus, it is an important attribute of any girl. I lit up, asked to try some on, but she just laughed. And when my mom left, I immediately reached into her locker, took another one, tried it on myself, and it looked ridiculous. At that moment, I really wanted my breasts to grow faster. I began to dream about it. What was the first thing I did? Of course, I went on the internet, where I read methods for breast augmentation. But I needed them to grow first. When I was 11 years old, I felt a strange sensation inside me. The place where my chest should be, it hurt. I felt some seals and complained to my mother. We went to the hospital, where they told us that my breasts were starting to grow. This news made me so happy. 
Could I also wear beautiful underwear? I waited, waited for a whole year, two, three, and my breast certainly grew, but it was not what I wanted. They were little. My mother told me to be patient and not to rush things, assuring me that everything has its time. But I couldn't wait to get my mom's bras. I went back to the internet and started looking at recipes for breast augmentation. One of the safest comments on the forum was, you should eat cabbage. Well, then you understand what I did? Yes, I ate this vegetable for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't really like cabbage, and when I sat on the cabbage menu for a week, I was already starting to feel sick at the very thought. Plus, I was experiencing eternal bloating. I didn't know that this vegetable could smell so bad. I had a hard time and I gave it up. I then came across another ad on the internet that said breasts can be enlarged by operation. Of course, the advertising looked spectacular. The pictures before and after were inspiring, but damn, I wasn't 18 years old yet, and who will give me such money for my chest? In addition, you need to be examined, and this requires parental permission. My mother will definitely not give it to me. She will call me crazy. Then I was looking for something else, and I found it. Some clinic raffled off breasts. It was something like an auction, but you needed to go through a couple of stages of participation in a competition. I realized that this was my real chance. I immediately registered on the site, wrote a letter, indicated my goal and preferences. I wanted a size 3 breast. I thought it would fit me. So what's the big deal for me? After all, I knew I would also grow, but I wanted ready-made breasts. I did not want to have to wait. The first stage was to subscribe to all your accounts on the clinic's page, write comments, make reposts, and so on. It was the easiest. The second one needed money. I do not know the exact amount, but the starting price of the breast was $200. I know it's not much money compared to how much the operation actually costs, but I didn't even have that money. The auction was scheduled in three weeks, and this meant that I had to collect this amount and more than the starting amount in a short time. I immediately ran to look for a part-time job. First of all, I agreed with my mother that she would pay me $5 a day for housework. She knew I hated cleaning, but she was interested in my suggestion, so we agreed. This meant that in three weeks, I could earn $105. A little, but better than nothing. Now I came home and quickly did my homework, then started cleaning, then ran to the neighbors and walked their dogs. I sold lemonades, cookies a couple of times, cleaned the yards of my grandmothers in the district, for which I also received money. Plus, I asked my father to give me money for my future birthday and give me the gift in advance. He agreed, giving me $50. In general, I was getting closer to the goal and it was good. Three weeks seemed like a hell of a lot, but I respected myself for having managed to save as much as $450. I was afraid to go alone, so I took a friend with me, and we went to the auction. The day before, I was very worried and nervous. I even thought that I might have changed my mind. The realization that I would voluntarily go under the knife was frightening, but I was striving for a dream and beauty requires sacrifices. Investments were sobering. So we arrived at the appointed place and looked around in surprise. I imagined a decent place with a lot of people, a large hall where, in addition to the breasts, perhaps something else would be played. But it was a terrible neighborhood. There was a garbage dump nearby. Even rats ran through it. Cheryl, my friend, asked if we were here, but unfortunately, we were. We knocked on the iron door. It was opened by some guy who asked who we were and why we came. I said that we came for the auction, and he opened the door and invited us inside. I was uneasy, but we went in anyway. The hall was more like a venue for a gathering of dirty rockers. It stank terribly. It was dark and suspicious. But I thought that maybe they do it on purpose. Suddenly they have such a style of work. Surprisingly, I was the only one of the participants. I was immediately asked how much money there is, I called the amount, and they took the money and gave me a certificate. Congratulations! Thanks to the certificate, you will be able to have the operation performed in our clinic. And that was all. They explained that since there were no people, I was the only one who wanted to, and so I won. I came home happy, but there was still some doubt inside. My mother came into my room and saw the certificate. 
What? What is this? I told her everything as it was. My mother sat down on the bed and said, My daughter, you have been deceived. What? It can't be. They even have their own website. I said, but when I went on the page, it no longer existed. You're lucky they didn't do anything to you. You should have told me, my mother said. I was very upset. I cried. I was sorry for the money, but nothing can be fixed. I've learned that lesson forever, but my breasts, my breasts are still growing. I hope they will be the way I want them to be. I want them to be. I want them to be. How does it feel to be a rejected child? How does it feel to live with the knowledge and awareness of your worthlessness and uselessness? How does it feel to know that you have no support and that all you have is yourself? Every day was like a struggle for survival. More than anything, I wanted to come home after school, wash my hands, change my clothes, and sit down at the dinner table with a hot meal waiting for me, and my mother asking, How are you doing, little girl? How was your day at school? But instead, I was getting the opposite. The exact opposite. My name is Emma. Who among you is a rejected child like me? Post any smiley faces in the comments, or if you like, you can share your story with me. Do you know what psychologists say about this? That our parents lived with toxic ancestors, so they became toxic themselves. Me to my family. While well, they're having a nice dinner without me noticing, I'll show you guys them. That's dad there at the table. He's stubbornly reading the newspaper. He does it every day. He's holding a newspaper or a tablet and diligently pretends to read the news, though in fact, he's texting with his mistress's secretaries. Under the newspaper, he usually hides his phone. That's my mom. Oh, she's wiping Ralph's mouth again. My dumbass brother. He's eight years old now, and she treats him like he's eight months old. The only thing he's added over the years is that he's learned to eat more than his body can handle. This company is so different. Everyone always has something on their minds, but the only thing they're unrealistically similar in is me, or rather, their attitude towards me. Whenever I came to this house for help, I was refused. All my questions were answered negatively. I was only needed for work or going to the store. I was told what to do and what not to do, but never asked what I wanted. I understood that my parents didn't need me. They only needed Rolf, so I treated life the same way, pretending I didn't need it. That's why I didn't have any friends. Every day I went to school where I didn't talk to anyone, and from there I went home quickly, where I didn't talk to anyone either. One day on the way home, I was accosted by two men and a woman. They asked the time, but I didn't answer, so the woman caught up with me, covered me with her hand, and pulled me toward their car. At first I reflexively screamed and tried to get away, but then I just put up with it. They took me somewhere outside the city, pulled me out of the car, put me in a chair, tied my hands, and said, Dictate your parents' phone number. We'll ask for your ransom. Instead of crying and getting hysterical, I looked them in the eye and then started laughing. I could not stop laughing and laughing. What's the matter? Did I say something wrong? No, dear, everything seems to be true, but why is she laughing? I don't understand it either. They were talking over each other, and I laughed even more at the expressions on their faces. Finally, when I got two stern reprimands, I came to my senses. Then I told them my parents wouldn't give them a cent if they knew I was the hostage. They didn't believe me. They thought it was my way of protecting money. Then I offered to check. Do you want to wait? Or I can call them myself. So we waited. Several hours passed. The time was nearing midnight and still no one called me. The kidnappers were perplexed. Well, how can you not call your daughter? This is midnight. Don't you wonder where she is? What if something happened to her? The woman asked. I looked at her and said, And you must have a child. The man answered instead, Of course we do. We have a daughter. She's young and we work hard for her. By stealing other children? I asked, to which they replied, Yes, it's just we need a lot of money and we don't have time, she said. I kicked the bag and asked them to call my mom from my number themselves. Mom picked up the phone sleepy and immediately started yelling that why the hell had I woken her up in the first place? I said that I was stolen, and she told me in response, You're stolen? Well, they'll return you because you're of no use, and we don't have any money anyway. My mother hung up on me, and I felt bad for the robbers. We sat in silence, and then I began to cry quietly, sobbing. The woman couldn't stand it, started hugging me and calming me down, and then she asked her husband to get some tissues and a glass of water. They don't need me. Why did they give birth to me in the first place? Why have a baby if you don't want it? 
Why do I need life if it's so useless? I screamed hysterically. The robbers had no time to wipe away the tears on my face. Then the man cut the rope so I could blow my nose. The woman hugged me hard, then put me on their couch and told her husband to make us something to eat. When he left for the kitchen, I calmed down a little. Wow, how clever of you to ask your husband to make dinner. Is there such a thing? My father never even poured himself a single cup of tea in his entire life, let alone for us, I said, cooling down a bit. The woman hugged me and said that it all depends on the woman and her status. And then she said that apparently my parents had had a very hard life that they were treating me this way. It's not that. They just don't like me, I said. After about 30 minutes, the man came in and set the table. He quickly had made some delicious pasta. I had a nice dinner, and then they put me down on the couch in their living room. The mugger wiped away my tears, then covered me with a blanket. Somehow, this was the best moment of my life, and even though it was all temporary, I felt as good as, well, as good as being home or something. I fell into a sound sleep. I don't know how much time passed. When I woke up in the middle of the night, I saw the man and woman sitting across from the TV, watching TV and laughing together, and most importantly, they were under the same blanket, cuddling and giggling. I wanted so badly to lie down next to them. I went over with my pillow, and the woman opened the plaid. Come on, dive in. Here, you want some popcorn? Her husband asked me, and we sat like that for a couple of hours, and then it was morning. My phone was still silent. Then my uncle called my mother from his and told her again that they were her daughter's kidnappers. But my mom said, Did you see the time? You woke up my baby, you knucklehead, and hung up on me. My aunt got all red with anger. I could see it wasn't about the money anymore. It was something else. They were angry. They put me in their car, fed me breakfast on the way, and I showed them the way to my house. Since it was weekend, everyone was home. Dad was fixing the car outside, Rolf was running around with a ball, and Mom was rustling around in the kitchen. Hi, Dad, I said to him, and he didn't even look up, said, Hi, and that was it. Rolf kicked the ball and hit me right in the forehead and broke my nose. It bled. My aunt gave him a smack, and she put a handkerchief on me. My mother saw this. She ran out with a wooden spoon in her hand and started yelling what the hell they were doing to her son. Son, what about your daughter? What about my daughter? It's her fault she got in his way. So the fact that she wasn't home for 24 hours didn't bother you? I told you to bring her back. I won't even go to the police because of someone like her. Ralph, let's go inside, honey. Mommy made pancakes for you. My aunt grabbed her hand, looked her in the eye, and said, She's your baby, too. My mom yanked her hand away and said, That's right, she's mine. But I don't want her. And you, get out of here. My aunt took the spoon out of her hands and threw it to the side. It hit my father right on his head. Rolf got scared and started crying, and Mama tried to calm him down. Then she ran at the kidnappers, screaming at them to get lost. Then my aunt came up close to her, like a UFC fighter at a weigh-in, pressed her forehead to her frightened face, and said, You have no idea what it means to be a real mom and love a child. I would give anything for the life of my seriously ill daughter. My husband and I look for money every day to save her, while people like you throw away your own child's life. You don't deserve her, she shouted and took me by the hand and dragged me to their car. I got in the back and we drove away from there, straight to the hospital. That's where I was introduced to their daughter. She has terminal cancer. The girl was happy for me while her parents went away. She asked me to look after them and told me that if I wanted, I could be their daughter and that I would be happy with them. Kitty was right. It's been three years since she died. I am living with my new family. Despite the circumstances, we are still happy. These people became my parents, and I became their daughter, and I felt needed. That's a strange thing about life. You never know how it might turn out. Hi everyone, my name is Ralph. I want to share with you the story of how I adopted my son, but it got out of my way. I tried my best to be a good father, but in the end I became his worst enemy. Look at my history and write your opinion in the comments, what you think about this. In general, it was like this. I was 20 years old when I met and fell in love with the girl of my dreams. Her name was Sarah. She was so amazing that my head immediately blew off. I was sure that she was my destiny, so I did not hesitate and after a couple of months I made an offer. Everything was fine with her until it came to the kids. We couldn't have a baby and it was a nightmare. 
Sarah was obsessed with pregnancy and did everything she could to make it work. Sometimes I felt like she was challenging herself and couldn't carry out the plan, which made her feel bad. In the end, when we were running around the hospitals, when the strength and money were already running out, she offered me to take a foster child. To be honest, I didn't like this idea right away, because I believed that we still have time. After all, it's only been a year. I was sure that I just need to try again. Maybe stupidly change the situation and that's it. But Sarah did not listen to me. She ran around all these orphanages and looked for a child for us. She didn't even really consult me and we had a lot of fights about it. In the end, she chose a boy in one of the boarding schools. You know, his name is Sam. And he was already 14 years old. Yes, this was far from a baby. Moreover, he already had a well-established mindset. He was not stupid, far from stupid, but so sharpened by the fact that he lives only one day. Sam was wild, like everyone else from boarding school, I think. In short, our first meeting with him took place, in fact, already at our home. I didn't go to pick him up from the orphanage. I decided to go to work instead. Sarah was beaming with happiness, but she knew I didn't support the idea. I held out my hand to Sam, and he looked at it like I was showing him my fist, very aggressively, so I took my hand away and went to my bedroom. In the evening we were going to dinner, and I sat down in my usual seat, but Sarah asked me to move. You see, Sam liked my place. I was indignant. They say I had been sitting there for a year, but Sarah asked me to give up the child. Okay, I agreed. After a while, it turned out that he liked my mug, my plate, my razor, my towel, and robe. I became really angry. What else could he like next? Maybe I belong in this house. I was angry with myself, but I didn't say anything yet. So we lived like this for about a week. It seemed endless, and I wanted it to be over and Sam to go back to his room. But I knew it would be cruel of me to take him there by the hand. And Sarah, she devoted all her time to him. Didn't even pay attention to me. Didn't talk to me. Didn't look at me. And didn't even listen. She was fully occupied only, as she said, with our son. But what can I do? I didn't feel that it was ours. He was a strange adult guy to me. What kind of son can he be to me? One day, Sarah ran off on business and left us alone. We sat down to breakfast. As soon as she left, I immediately took out my phone and began to stare at it and eat more. Sam turned up the TV and looked at it. A few minutes later, I heard him rummaging in the purse that Sarah had left behind. The guy took her wallet, pulled out the money, and put it all back. I'm just freaking out from such impudence. Why did you take someone else's money? Not even shy, I asked maliciously. And Sam says to me, it's not your money. I want to take it. I tried to explain to him that this is our money and that he is like our son and so we do not have in the house, but brazenly told me that Sarah is his new mother and that she loves him more than me and that very soon I will not be in this house. And then I burst out. I got angry. I started yelling at him, and then Sarah came in. She saw such a picture, Sam is still an actor, immediately fell to the floor and pretended to hit him. I told him it wasn't true, that he'd made it up, but Sarah wouldn't listen. Well, then Sam said I yelled at him for stealing money when he didn't take it. Sarah reached into her wallet and couldn't find any money, so I told her to check his pockets. Sam turned them out and showed them that they were empty. But how is this possible? I saw it myself. Then Sarah came up to me and felt my pockets, where she found the money. How did he manage to slip them to me and when? Do you understand what happened after that? That's right, Sarah kicked me out of the house. Sam got his way, he pushed me out, and now he had no boundaries, he took my rightful place. Sarah didn't even look at me as I packed my bags, and the nasty guy opened the door for me and waved goodbye with a grin. I was so angry, I went to see my colleague. It's good that he took me in and told him about the situation. Then he asked me to stay with him temporarily and come up with a plan to get back. A colleague said that there would probably be a time when Sam decided to steal from Sarah very big and that this would require proof. Of course, not all at once, but it's worth waiting and catching the moment. First of all, on the advice of a colleague, I wrote to Sarah that I love her, but since there is no place for me in the house, I am leaving for my homeland. She knows where I'm from. It was important that she knew I wasn't here and that Sam found out. As we all knew, as soon as I kind of left, the little bastard got really fucked up. While Sarah was at work, he didn't go to school, threw parties at our house, drank alcohol, and smoked drugs. I caught it all on camera. Sam stole a car from our neighbors and got drunk behind the wheel. He crashed the car and immediately called Sarah and said it was all my fault. That is, her husband. 
Yeah, in this state, he forgot I wasn't around. I could hear everything, sitting nearby from behind the bushes and filmed everything. Thirty minutes later, Sarah arrived. She was dealing with the neighbors. At this time, Sam's friends managed to escape, and he took something to cut off. Sarah wrote out a check for car repairs and then went to the house to deal with it. I technically climbed to the second floor and sat next to the window to listen in on the conversation. Sarah told him that I was out of town, and then she cried bitterly, saying that it was hard for her to be with him. Instead of asking for forgiveness, Sam raised his hand to her and slapped her to the face. Sarah was in shock and asked him not to do it, but he hit her again. I couldn't stand it and climbed through the window. They were both in shock, and then I showed them the video. Sam didn't know what to say, and Sarah started to cry even more. Everything was clear. Yes, we got the baby back. My wife realized that we are not ready to raise such an adult child. So for now, we agreed to become parents of our baby, and then we'll see. And then we'll see. And then we'll see. Some say I leave a trail of chaos behind wherever I go. But it's not true. Not for everyone. Fine, maybe some girls trip, spill coffee on themselves, or end up with a bowl of soup on their heads. But if they didn't want that to happen, they wouldn't flirt with my boyfriend. If you want more insane stories like this one, make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We appreciate it. Dating Flynn was difficult. Do you have any idea how hard it is to keep girls away from your boyfriend when he's so handsome and charming and funny and smart? Every girl around him became obsessed within minutes. I could tell by the look in their eyes. Even his family's obsessed with him. His mom texted him every single day like a psycho. I eavesdropped when they talked. Was she trying to introduce him to someone else? I always felt she was against our relationship. Oh, you look so pretty in this dress, said her mouth, but her eyes said the opposite. I hated going to visit Flynn's family. It was all hugs and kisses and questions. They kept asking when we were going to get engaged, or if we were planning on having kids. They just wanted me to hesitate so they could tell Flynn I wasn't serious about him. I could tell. Everyone was out to get me. That's exactly why I almost dropped the plates I was holding when I eavesdropped on Flynn talking to his mom before our anniversary. Are you sure the house will be ready for Thursday? He asked. In less than a second, I was putting the pieces together. Let's see. Our two-year anniversary was on Thursday. The house is what he calls his childhood home. Something was missing, I thought. Before Flynn laughed and said, She's gonna love it. Bingo. She had to be me. He wanted to spend our anniversary at his parents' house. I had to make him change his plans. Stat! First, I picked a really romantic movie about a couple taking a trip to watch that night. Why can't you be romantic like that? I asked him. I knew he was competitive, so that would get him going. Then I started leaving brochures for couples' retreats all over our apartment. I found one of the brochures taped to the fridge with a little note that said, Fine. Ha <laughs> I won! No anniversary at his parents' house. We picked a spa in the countryside for our anniversary. It was a few hours away, so we loaded our car with our bags and all sorts of snacks. I decided to drive because it had been my idea to go so far. A while after we left the city behind, the sky turned dark and Flynn started getting nervous. It was raining badly. Flynn kept drumming his fingers on the car door and scratching the back of his neck. I turned towards him and caressed the side of his face to calm him down. He gave me a little smile, but it faded and his face was lit up by headlights ahead. I managed to swerve right before we collided with a huge truck barreling towards us. The car bounced off the highway. Everything around me was spinning until the car crashed into a tree and we stopped. I turned to face Flynn immediately. My heart sank when I saw that he was unconscious, but he seemed fine aside from the ping-pong ball-sized bump on his head. I jumped out of the car and ran over to his side. I managed to pull him out of the car and set him down on the grass. My poor, handsome angel! He was out cold! There was nobody around for miles. But in the darkness, I could see the outline of a building. I managed to throw Flynn's limp body on my back and dragged him towards the building. I realized it was a huge barn. The doors were slightly open, so I pushed them and threw Flynn on a stack of hay. There were sacks of animal feed everywhere. They weighed a ton, but I dragged some around and arranged them into a makeshift mattress. Before I knew it, I was out cold too. I woke the next morning to a rooster's cry. God, for a second I thought the crash had been a nightmare. I remembered Flynn's condition and turned to face him, but I found him sitting a little further away from where I left him. 
looking at me with curious eyes. I leapt towards him and threw my arms around his neck. Sweetie, you're okay. I was so worried, I said, touching the spot where the bump was almost gone. Flynn's eyes widened, and he looked really confused. Who are you? He asked softly. I backed up. What do you mean, honey? I'm your girlfriend. I laughed. He's kidding, right? I thought. Girlfriend? He repeated as if it was the first time he was hearing that word. He looked down at his body, then at mine. He pointed at me and asked, Why do you look like that? Did he... forget who I am? Like, actually? Did he forget what I am? Flynn, honey, I'm a woman. I'm your girlfriend, I explained, holding his face in my hands. He said girlfriend again and smiled. What does that mean? He asked. I planted a kiss on his lips and smiled. It means we can do that, I said. I knew he always loved kissing, so I wasn't surprised to see him grin from ear to ear from that. It was hard to get him off of me, but I had to go look for the car and grab our stuff. I could hardly believe it. My perfect boyfriend forgot who I am and what women are. So many possibilities swirled in my mind. No more competition. All I had to do was keep him in our little love barn. He would never see another woman, and I wouldn't have to worry for the rest of my life. After I grabbed a few bags of clothes and food from our wrecked car, I walked back to the barn whistling a tune. When I opened the barn, I dropped everything from my hands and gasped. Flynn, who did this to you, honey? I said as I ran to him. The love of my life was tied to a chair, and his mouth was taped shut. Step away and put your hands where we can see them. I heard someone yelling. I jumped away from Flynn and threw my hands in the air. I turned towards the barn doors and saw an old man holding a trident menacingly. A younger man next to him was swinging around some rope. Want me to tie her up too, Pops? He asked. Nah, replied the old man. Y'all got till the cops show up to get off my property. He grumbled at Flynn and me. The two men walked out of the barn towards a little house I could see in the distance. Wait! I yelled, running after them outside. I fell on my knees and begged them to let us stay. I explained that we were in an accident, but they didn't care. They didn't want a couple living in their barn. I had to do something. My perfect life alone with Flynn was crumbling. We're siblings! I blurted out. We're siblings! We're running away from our parents! They're psychotic! I cried. I managed to get tears to flow from my eyes, and the old man's expression changed. Well, that's a different story. He murmured. Fine. He said. You can stay in the barn, but as long as you're here, you work to pay for your food and rent. He said. I was so happy I wanted to kiss his muddy boots. I went back to Flynn and untied him. I explained the conversation to him. I don't mind hard work as long as I'm with you. He smiled, (laughs) turning me into a puddle. We spent the rest of the day working on the farm. There was some old, dusty furniture stored in the barn, so we turned a corner of the barn into a living area. We even made a dining table out of crates. I went to the owner's house to grab the food we worked so hard for when I spotted a threat. Stepping out of a car was a stunning woman. She was built like a model. There were alarms going off in my head, but I had to feel her out before panicking. I approached her and introduced myself. Her smile almost melted my corneas. I'm Samira. My dad owns this farm, she said. She was all bubbly and pretty and sweet. Ugh, I hated her. I needed to keep Flynn away from her at all costs. He didn't know other women existed, let alone ones this stunning. I took the food back to the barn, shaking with nerves. What was I going to do if Flynn saw Samira? I found Flynn sitting at our makeshift table looking at something. Babe, what's this? He asked. What he was holding in his hands made my knees buckle. It was an engagement ring. He found it in his bag. So that means, before he lost his memory, I choked up when I explained to Flynn what that was. When I was having dinner with Flynn, I forgot all about Samara. It was just the two of us, as it always should be. I spent the next day desperately keeping Flynn and Samara from seeing each other. I smacked the back of Samara's horse when I was helping her out with it, so it galloped away with her on top before Flynn could see her. Then I threw chicken feed all over Flynn as Samira walked by, so all she saw was a cloud of chickens. I went to great lengths, so by the time I shut the doors to the barn that evening, I was exhausted. When I turned around, my exhaustion disappeared. Flynn had covered the barn in candles, set the table, and he was wearing the nicest out of the clothes he brought. I was awestruck. He was nervous all throughout dinner. I did some research, he said. 
He pulled the ring box out of his pocket. I think this is the right moment. He smiled, opening the box. The ring looked beautiful, glistening in the candlelight. My eyes filled up with tears. Jenny, will you... Flynn began, before he was cut off by a scream in the distance. He was startled and stood up instantly. Someone's in danger! He exclaimed before running out the doors. Seriously? Who's inconsiderate enough to start dying when I'm about to get engaged? I followed Flynn into the darkness. Soon enough, we found the problem, and my heart sank. Lit up by the moonlight was Samira, looking glorious sitting on a horse. The expression on Flynn's face broke my heart. He looked like he was seeing an angel. Help! yelped Samara. I noticed her horse was surrounded by coyotes. Flynn reacted, grabbing a rake and swinging it at the coyotes, scaring them away. Flynn then extended his hand to help Samara off her horse. Every second their hands stayed touching each other, my temper rose even more. Before I knew it, I was seeing red. I couldn't control myself as I jumped Samara and knocked her to the ground. Next thing I knew, I was being pulled off from her by her father and brother. You really like that rope, don't you? I yelled at the owner's son as he tied me up. Soon enough, I was tied up in the back of a cop car. Personally, I think Samira overreacted by pressing charges. Now I'm stuck in county jail. Flynn comes to visit me every now and then, but I have a feeling Samira's making moves on my man. I can see them through the bars in my cell window after his visits. Why does she need to pick him up? Why does she need to linger when they hug? Why do they hug in the first place? I swear, the second I get out of here, I'm coming to get my man. And I'm getting close. My tunnel is almost done. You just wait, Samira. You don't know what I'm capable of. For Flynn, I'll do anything. When I was lying in bed, my sister suddenly spilled a bottle of milk and cereal on me. <gasps> what the heck are you doing? Although I was screaming, she still live-streamed the whole scene. Follow my channel to see more videos of me trolling my sister. You pay for this! After saying that, I immediately beat her up. And so, our fight scene was broadcast live online. Hi, I'm Peach. Two years ago, my sister Sika and I founded a YouTube channel called Carney Sisters to share tips about fashion and beauty. I took charge of filming and coming up with ideas. Sika was the one who appeared on the screen. At first, everything went very well. Our channel grew extremely fast. But then, things started to change when Sika wanted to make more money by taking ads from unknown cosmetic brands and performing stupid challenges to attract viewers. I wasn't happy with that at all. We ended up quarreling all the time. After learning that Sika and I had a fight in a live stream, my parents were furious. Dad even cancelled my trip with my friends and didn't allow me to use the internet for a while. Not only that, that fighting video became a hot topic at our school. We were constantly made fun of. The scene when I pulled my sister's hair even became the most used meme for weeks afterward. And what's worse is my scholarship application was badly affected. The university I applied for felt concerned after seeing my fight video. They wanted more time to evaluate me. Contrary to how tragic it was to me, Sika enjoyed it as a victory. She gloated every time someone commented or shared that video. Stop being stupid, Sika. You are stupid. The success of our channel is based on my popularity. A loser like you can't contribute anything. We realized that we couldn't work with each other anymore. However, we also didn't want the other to have that channel. Finally, after a heated argument, Sika made a proposal. Fine, if you prove yourself better than me, I'll give you that channel. How? I'll choose the most unattractive guy in school to be your partner. With your fashion sense, you must both become the king and queen at the school prom. Serious, I quickly agreed to that. We also signed a contract together as evidence. The next morning, Sika and I sat in the cafeteria and searched for the most unattractive guy. After listing all the names, she finally pointed to the corner of the room where a guy with a cranky face and sloppy clothes was sitting. Perfect! He'll be your partner! No way! I knew him. That's Beavis, an antisocial guy who was always scowling and annoyed. And his fashion sense sucks. Making him king? Ugh. I tried to convince Sika to change her mind, but she refused. Then say goodbye to the YouTube channel. 
Although I knew that making Beavis the prom king was impossible, I couldn't let my sister have the YouTube channel that I built so hard. Therefore, I must try my best. At lunchtime that day, I put on a beautiful outfit and approached Beavis as friendly as possible. Hi, Beavis. Can I sit with- Nope. What? Cat here, well, doll. I have no reason to talk to you. He casually took the tray of food and left. What? So rude. My cheeks flushed with anger and I immediately chased after him to give him a piece of my mind. But suddenly, Sika, who was sitting near there, tripped me. My whole body fell forward just as Beavis turned around and his whole tray of food fell on top of me. Everyone in the cafeteria burst into laughter when they saw that scene. I helplessly looked at Beavis, asking for help but he just raised his eyebrows slightly in surprise. In the end, he just coldly left. The next day, I secretly followed Beavis to know what kind of person he really is. After a while of walking on the streets, he suddenly entered the hospital. Out of curiosity, I followed. However, when I got to the ward, the receptionist kept me because visiting hours were over. Quickly, I snuck inside a changing room nearby, put on a janitor's uniform, and easily entered the ward. While I was searching, a male nurse called me. You! Come here quickly, I need a janitor urgently. Oh, I had no choice but to follow him. He led me into a room where a little girl was screaming and throwing food everywhere. Unfortunately, the nurse left soon after because of an urgency, leaving me alone with that girl. Come on, kiddo. Anger doesn't solve anything. Do you want to talk it out? I don't want to continue treatment anymore. It makes me lose my hair. I'm ugly. The little girl kept screaming and crying. Feeling bad for her, I lifted my shirt up, showing her the scar on my stomach. It's the result of a surgery. Even though it's ugly, I love it. The scar reminded me of how strong I was. Don't worry, kiddo. Your hair will grow back. After a while, she finally calmed down. Calling herself Sunny, she told me that she had lung cancer. A few months ago, her condition worsened and she was admitted to the hospital. We were having a nice chat when suddenly, Beavis appeared. Turns out, Sunny is his sister. After taking her away, Beavis and I sat down together. He shyly spoke up. Thanks for helping my sister. Then he started sharing his story. His dad died in an accident a few years ago, and his sister became terminally ill. As bad things kept happening, he began to lose faith in life and became hostile to everyone. As I understood more about Beavis, I realized he wasn't as mean as he looked. Since then, Beavis and I have talked more and become closer. I really want his life to get better. I asked Sika to end the contract, but she no. refused and even called me a loser. Furiously, I told her, Fine, you'll see. That day, I decided to help Beavis change his gloomy look. After Sunny and I worked together to persuade him, he finally agreed. We went shopping together and tried on many clothes. Unexpectedly, Beavis has cute sides too. Later that day, on our way home, he shyly asked, Do you mm, want to go to the prom with me? <laughs> Needless to say, I agreed. That day, I couldn't stop thinking about him. On the day of the prom, just as I expected, the principal stood on the stage and named Beavis and I the king and queen of this year's prom. Before I could share that joy with him, he suddenly mm -hmm. looked coldly at me. So now I'm useless to you, right? What? You don't have to pretend anymore. Yesterday, Sika told me about your contract, using me to achieve your goal. Are you happy? Even though I tried to explain, Beavis just left with disappointment. I know I should have been happy to get the channel back from my sister, but what happened to Beavis left me devastated. I had heard him. Right after that, I went to see Sika. You won! The YouTube channel is yours! I don't need it anymore! What I need are my loved ones! And of course, that includes you! I sighed and left. Sika was utterly surprised. In the days that followed, I locked myself in my room and contacted no one. What just happened made me feel so depressed. But then one morning, I unexpectedly saw Beavis standing in front of my house. Hi, I'm Beavis. Can we get to know each other? Beavis said as he extended his hand towards me. What are you doing? I was surprised, but he just smiled. <laughs> we got off to a bad start. Do you want to start over? 
As it turned out, Sika felt apologetic, so she looked for Beavis to explain everything and convinced him to make up with me. After knowing the truth, Beavis decided to give us a chance to start over. I smiled <laughs> happily at him. At that moment, all misunderstandings between us were cleared. I'm so glad everything is going well now. Beavis and I have gradually become closer, and Sika has reduced her interest in popularity. We made up with each other and decided that the YouTube channel Carney Sisters would still have both of us. It's great, isn't it? Thank you.